sit. Good dog, now you stay, you hush. Um, and then I got a job. This is the worst. I worked as a towel boy at something called the Auburndale Health Club in Watertown. It was a very she she. They called me something other than a towel boy, but I was, in effect, a towel boy who every once in a while was entrusted with the job of checking people in, having them show their card, and then, and then working out on an unbelievably inelegant and clunky computer system, how many visits they had. But anyway, okay, here's why I quit that job. Oh. I'm sitting there working that job, and who should walk in um, to get their towel but Michael Ryan. And Michael Ryan is best known now for a book called Secret Life, which is this kind of... Pretty hair raising memoir, yeah. but at the time, yeah, not to mention it's worth petting a dog. Um, um, I'm, 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 I'm. But anyway, Michael Ryan had received a Whiting Writers Award the same year I had, like, two years early in 1987. So I see this guy that I've been up on this <laughs> rostrum with having Eudora Welty give us this prize, and two years later, I'm like, and I can remember, I can see the only time I've literally dived under something to have somebody avoid seeing me, like he came in, and I pretended, I pretended not very subtly to slip and went under the counter and had the lady that was there. And I, I, I forget, I think I lay face down and didn't respond, and she, of course, didn't want to be going, David, what's wrong while well, the guest is there? So she gave him the towel. And I remember I somehow, I worked the rest of that day, like I would peer around corners to see what room he was in, and then dash and put the towel in the towel bin. And I remember I left that day, and I, and I didn't go back. I'm sorry to get some word like send you. You were shaking your head when I said send you. You don't see yourself that much? No, I don't. Why not? I, but I, I, I see myself as somebody who's been unbelievably burned by no one other than me through not being centered. I have an enormous ambition to be centered, but I don't I don't perceive myself as that way. And I, and I wouldn't be so careful about this kind of stuff if I felt very much confidence that I could handle it well. And I'm aware that this makes very good copy and this will be a neat part of the article, but it's also really like... It, it, you know, I feel like we've sort of become friends and I understand that. I mean, this stuff, I, it, it's really scary. And I think if we were in exactly the opposite situation, you'd be saying a lot of the same stuff. It's great, but it's also it's also really scary at the same time because I've got a, you know, I've, I've got what I hope is like 40 more years of work ahead of me. And I'm somewhere I want to tell you. into, um, I decided that I need. I really need to find a few things that I believe in in order to stay alive. And one of them is that this is a, that I'm extraordinarily lucky to be able to do this kind of work. And that along with that luck comes a tremendous obligation to do the best, to do the very best I can, which means that I have to structure my life, you know, sort of like anybody who's dedicated to something, to maximize my ability to, to do good stuff. And it's just like... Um, it doesn't make me a great person. It just makes me a person that's really exhausted a couple other ways to live, you know, and really taken them, taken them to their conclusion, which for me was a pink room, you know, with no furniture and a drain in the center floor, which is where they put me for an entire day when they thought I was going to kill myself, where they, you don't have anything on and somebody's observing you through a slot in the wall. And when that happens to you, you get tremendous, you get unprecedentedly willing to examine other alternatives for how to live. I have this, I, I, here's this thing where it's going to sound sad to you, I have this unbelievably, like, five-year-old belief that art is just absolutely magic, and that good art can do things that nothing else in the solar system can do. I don't know, now you've got me thinking, there's there's so much beauty and profundity and all kinds of <laughs> pop culture all around us, like, like, living in Bloomington, one of the things that I do, you have to listen to a lot of country music, because that's like pretty much all there is on the radio when you're tired of like, you know, listening to Green Day on the one college station. And these, these country musics that are just so, you know, baby, since you've left, I can't live, I'm drinking all the time and stuff. And I remember just being real impatient with it until I'd been living there about a year. And I all of a sudden realized that what if you just imagine that this absent lover they're singing to is just a metaphor. What they're really singing is to themselves or to God, you know, since you've left, I'm so empty, I can't live, my life has no meaning, that in a, that in a weird way, I mean, they're, they're incredibly existentialist songs that have the patina of the absent, of the romantic shit on it just to make it saleable, but that all the pathos and heart that comes out of them is they're singing about something much more elemental being missing, and they're being incomplete without than just, you know, some girl in tight jeans or something. And it's so weird, it's like you live immersed in this stuff, it's very Flannery O'Connor-ish, and then every once in a while you realize that it's all the same, and it's all about the really profound shit.
and that it's adjusted in various ways to talk to various demographic groups for commercial reasons, but that if you cock your ear and listen real close, it's that it's the, you know, what else have you, where else have you seen that kind of uh, like stuff coming out of shit pop culture? Wow. Oh, God, everything. I mean, even we, we were making jokes about Love Boat and Baywatch, which is really, the really commercial, really reductive shows that we so love to sneer at are also tremendously compelling because the predictability in popular art, the really formulaic stuff, the stuff that makes no attempt to surprise or do anything artistic is so profoundly soothing. And it, even, even, even the densest or most tired viewer can see what's coming and it gives you a sense of order and that everything's going to be all right that this is a narrative that will take care of you and won't in any way challenge you it's like being wrapped in, in a chamois blanket and nestled against a big generous tit you know and that okay in, in art wise maybe that's not the greatest art but the function that it provides is, is, is deep in a certain way that it, all this stuff is like deadly serious and really deep all the time and uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that you should go around being some kind of scholar of pop culture dismantling it all or stuff, but that it's that we find that, that art finds a way to take care of you, to take part, you kind of despite itself. And that's one of the cool things about Kale is Kale Kale writes about the miracle of that all the odds are stacked against you know the profundity, you know the the writing about the Hollywood system and stuff, and like like crabgrass or like Jeff Goldblum says in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. You know, that like the cool stuff and the magic stuff comes out all the time. The trick, you know, if, if there's one thing that the, that the serious art can do is that, it, is that it can try to put you in places where you're more alive to hearing that. You know, that it can, that it can seduce you into paying attention to stuff in a way that, that, that's hard to pay attention to. Can you give me an example of things you've seen or what you've found in a pretty shitty So it's weird. So like how the, how the like... I mean, it really is, you know, you've got this enormous lump of shit and then a rose growing out of it, you know? And then you realize that the more rank the shit, the more, <laughs> the more saprogenic the shit, the more fertile it is, too. And it's not like, oh, pop culture is great, we're surrounded by this beauty all the time, but the trick is, is, if, is, is if you can get the right arrangement in your head and get kind of in the right spirit to really try to pay attention and do the work to like see what's beautiful in it. The paradox is that the popular stuff is training you not to do the work. It's telling you you don't have to do the work. I don't think writers are any smarter than other people. I think they, they're made more compelling in their stupidity or in their confusion. Stuff said out loud on the page doesn't look said out loud, it's just a crazy.